I finally know what it's like for parents that have to deal with their kids being home for the summer. I am so sorry. <laughs> oh, I love you with all my heart, but my God, you're a pain in my ass. Oh. Hello, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, sup? Happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, it's when I do something on my channel called Bat Movies in a B, the series on my channel where I talk about bat movies while putting my makeup on. Russ, I'm filming this on Friday, which I have not done in so long, but obviously I have a lot of distraction. <laughs> I am this close, this close to swaddling you so that you can't move and then you go to bed like an actual baby. I have not slept well in the last week. I also am kind of depressed. That's just what depression be doing. It comes up sometimes and it's sudden and unexpected and unprovoked. And then on top of that, I have my baby who's home from school and she has a whole bunch of pent up energy because she's not allowed to play because she just got spayed. She has a few more days left until she gets her stitches taken out and you're going back to school. Yes, you are. You're gonna be back and out of my face all the time because I know you're sick of me and I'm sick of you and I love you with all my heart, but you're gonna have to go back to school, bye-bye. But do you know what will help me feel a little better? A check to pay some bills. So I'm gonna send it over to Admiral Kenny, thank you. Hello everyone, this is Iroh Kenny and today's video is sponsored by Raycon. Raycon's everyday earbuds offer quality sound at a fraction of the price of other premium audio brands, all without compromising style, function, or performance. And because Raycon doesn't outsource their design or development of their earbuds, they can pass those savings on to you and again, get it to you at about half the price of other premium audio brands. They have noise isolation and awareness mode. They're sweat and water resistant and have some of the most impressive playtime that I've had in any earbuds with about eight hours. They have different sound profiles. I'm personally a bass girl and custom gel tips so that you can get the perfect fit for your ear holes. If you don't take my word for it, feel free to check out the over 50,000 five-star reviews for them. And you can get them for as little as $18 if you use their buy now, pay later options. And rest assured, I use that noise isolation function because my dog is home these days and I've been trying to get work done and all I hear is her barking. <laughs> and it's this beautiful muting of her screaming at me while I'm on the toilet because she wants me to hurry up. They're also great for working out unwinding, listening to audiobooks, listening to podcasts, whatever you're doing, Raycon has got you covered. So if you would like to check out Raycon, click on the link down in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash Kenny to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Big thanks again to Raycon for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery. Last time we were here, uh... Oh, we watched Black Romance on Passion Flicks. A Brother's Honor. A quintessentially uh, passion flicks-esque film, but it had in it. So that was that was the only difference. If you wanna check it out, it'll be linked up above or you can check it out in the Bad Movies and a Beat playlist. And today I'm revisiting a early 2000s bad movie classic. Movie that is touted for generally no other reason <laughs> than being possibly the f worst film that came out in the year it came out. It's one of those movies that I've always in my mind mentally tethered to Geely and that it's a part of early 2000s trash infamy that stars pop stars and it being bad is the only thing that we garner from it more so even than what the movie is about. Speaking of Geely, I've made a whole video on Geely. It's uh, unironically one of the funniest movies I've ever seen on accident. And it was one of my favorite videos I've made. So I will we'll link that down below as well if you wanna watch. If you wanna see Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck in their original romp around Hollywood romance, aren't they married now? But today we're looking at another uh, uh, pop diva, Mariah Carey. Don't jump like that, jump on something soft. Yes. Thank you. Today we're looking at Glitter 2001. Um, if you're around my age or older, you probably remember Glitter as being an absolute box office bomb and that's it. It earned Carrie the worst actress award at the Razzies. As a side note, I've yet to receive my invitation to a Razzie. My email is there, babe. My contacts are there. Hit me up. My people talk to your people. 
I wanna go to the Razzies, damn it. It's, it's literally my bread and butter. Make it happen. But Glitter is a romantic drama musical about a woman named Billy Frank, played by Mariah Carey, trying to make it as a singer in the 1980s, along with her best friends, one of which is played by the brat, by the way which is cool. And this movie has long been known for being bad. That's that's about it. And I've always wanted to get around to it because I've always wondered like, why? Why is it touted as one of the worst films to come out in the early 2000s? And I was just really excited to just witness it in all its glory. Like, what is it that's actually so bad? And then part of me also wondered if it was getting a harsher rep because people like to shit on pop stars that branch out into acting because it was Mariah Carey. I wonder if there was some like, you know, misogyny or some like undermining her as a pop star trying to do a completely different art form or whatever. And the short and sweet is that, sure, that may be a part of it, but at the end of the day, this movie sucks. <laughs> this movie's really bad. With that said, again, I'm coming into this as a person who has an entire career based off of how I watch garbage. So in my like tolerance level, this is pretty low. It's almost comparatively wholesomely bad because it's just like bad acting and some questionable romance tropes. Mariah Carey having no range of emotion at all as an actress. She's not particularly good at any scene, but she's shockingly bad at like any heightened emotion, anger or crying or anything like that, which is interesting. People usually do well with anger because <laughs> it's something that we've all felt at some point or another. Well, I guess we've all felt sadness. We've all felt theoretically ranges of emotion. That doesn't make us all good actors. But anyway, yeah, she did terrible. Um. But outside of that, it's like a like a PG-13 showgirls, a trite story about an aspiring star who sets off into the music industry, finds love, finds struggle, has to leave people behind or rediscover herself. They also throw in like a footnote of her having a tumultuous childhood with a mother who had to give her up to foster care because she has an addiction. And then along the way, they vaguely remember that they have to return back to that story at some point for her to find her mother. So there's nothing Nothing particularly about it that is unique other than the fundamental fact that Mariah Carey is acting poorly in it, which is to some degree <laughs> to be expected. Like that's the only thing that people would kind of remember this for. It's that movie that Mariah Carey was in and it was bad. But I think I was a bit disappointed because I wanted it to be a bit more Geely adjacent, just unhinged, <laughs> where this movie isn't quite that. It's not quite as batshit as I was hoping. Honestly, it's quite tedious and boring more than anything. I did like the songs that came from it. So I was listening to the soundtrack, but regardless, I did watch it. It was on YouTube, by the way. <laughs> uh, so I'm here to talk about it. So without further ado, this is Glitter. 2001. So the movie begins with Billy's mom, Lillian, singing in like a little dive bar. And she's very comfortable on stage. You can tell that she has, like she's a star and she has this beautiful voice, but she's struggling to keep things together because she's obviously intoxicated. So she invites her daughter, Billy, to come onto the stage to sing as well, to kind of support her while she's performing. And they do a duet. The little girl sings her ass off. And inside. And she's like, yep, my baby's gonna be a star. But soon after this, or maybe because of this, because she's not keeping herself like together, um, she ends up getting fired from her position and isn't able to really provide for Billy. She's able to scramble a few dollars from Billy's father, but eventually Billy ends up sent to foster care when Lillian accidentally lights their home on fire after falling asleep with a cigarette in her hand. While at foster care, she meets her two best friends, Roxy and Louise, who grow up with her into adulthood. And next thing you know, fast forward and it's 1983 and the girls are all dancers at a club. They end up getting scouted by a man named Timothy Walker, played by Terrence Howard, who is looking to hire them as backup dancers and backup singers to his artist's name, like Silk or some shit. She doesn't matter. And Billy turns them down because she's like, oh, well, she's bad. Like the artist is bad. She's a bad singer. <laughs> and I don't want to be backup dancer to a terrible singer. But her friends ultimately convince her to reconsider and they decide to take the job. And the girl is awful. She's truly terrible. I've taken chances of romances once or twice. 
But the to- the whole time she was singing, I'm like, she sounds so familiar. And I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be shady. There is a person who has a music career right now that sounds like this, and I cannot put my finger on it. And I found it in my heart that you are treasure. If you want to be funny and shady, you should put those down in the comment section because I cannot put my finger on it, but she sound like somebody and it's driving me insane. Timothy is like, let's uh, lower, <laughs> let's lower her mic and raise Billy's up because she can just lip sync over it, right? So this artist starts going around singing, lip singing Billy. She doesn't seem to be offended by that at all. I'm sure she must have noticed or maybe... <laughs> Maybe she's delusional, like, damn, I sound incredible. But at one of the um, clubs they perform at, there's a DJ named Dice who is completely enamored by the new song because he knew her as not being able to carry a note in a bucket. So he's like, oh, that's fascinating. She must've been taking vocal lessons or something because I didn't know she could sing. And then backstage, Dice goes to talk to the girls about their performance. And while there, a photographer wants to take a picture, but the artist is like, um, they're just back up. You don't need to take pictures of them. And so to shut her up, Billy starts singing the part. And I'm so into you, that's forever and ever. Which, duh, she has leverage over you, bitch. <laughs> like, why would you? So she starts singing and obviously that's her voice. So Dice goes up to Billy and he's like, you can't let them use your voice like that. Like you, you could, you have so much to offer. Like you should be singing yourself. It's pretty obvious at this point that this is gonna be our love interest for the movie. Fine, even though neither of them are great actors, but he like gives her the mic in the audience so that she can sing when he's going around letting people kind of freestyle. They edit it in one of the most peculiar ways I've ever seen. It was giving very Vanilla Sky. It's just jarring and gratuitous. Ends with her singing, but it's like not sync to her mouth at all. So it's this awful lip singing. Like they didn't even try to match her with the dub over, which is hilarious to me, but okay. But afterwards he's like, I believe in you and I believe that you can have a career. Let me produce for you. She's like, well, I'm working with Timothy. And he's like, Timothy, I will figure that out. Work with me. So Dice goes up to Timothy after some more terrible 2001 editing, of course. And they negotiate Dice paying to work with the girls for 100K. In 1983, money money in general, but 1983, that's crazy. So they agree and thus begins Billy's performing and working with Dice. Make her first single, which is a banger by the way. I didn't mean to turn you on. Let me save that to Spotify real quick. Like I said, the only thing I like from this movie is the soundtrack. I think this was the album that Lover Boy was on when they did the cameo sample. It was, much of the music is like 80s music samples. I love it. But after the performance, she has some random dude try to sign her to a label and Dice is like, nah, 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 you gotta reach higher. We're going for big people, not just some random label. You can do better than that. And so they continue to go to shows, continue to schmooze with record execs that are looking for the next big thing until she's ultimately signed to a bigger label. And meanwhile, Dice and Billy's relationship seems to be getting a little bit more personal on top of the work uh, situation, which no, 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 never that. Don't date the bag, don't date the business. Uh, they end up at his house though, because he shows her a marimba. I don't think that's why they end up at his house, but it's kind of funny because there's no gap between him showing her a marimba and her being like, oh my God, I'm in love. But after that, her career starts to take off. They start to play her music on radio shows and it's very exciting because she's finally starting to get some traction as a musician. She's starting to make music videos for her songs and starting to get predated on by directors and other people of the industry. They want her to be more naked. They want to get rid of her friends as backup. They, they want her to get a publicist that'll kind of like push her and pull her in different directions, you know, kind of prodding at her to make her into a star. And it would seem, at least at this point, that Dice is in her corner at this point. He's there to tell people like, hey, she's uncomfortable, back up. We're not doing that. She doesn't want to do it, blah, blah, blah. To such an extent that when she got uncomfortable on the music set, he just takes her off. But rest assured, in case you were wondering, Dice is indeed a piece of shit because this is a romance movie from the early 2000s. Do you think a man was a decent person just because he's the protect girl? <laughs> no. 
know. He sucks. Later, Dice ends up meeting up with Timothy at the studio while Billy is recording her music. Now, I was very confused by this because this conversation would suggest some animosity between the two, but I didn't understand because I was like, well, y'all did a deal. He paid you $100,000 and now you're working with Billy. I don't understand what we're upset about. We find out way too late in the story like in the cadence of the film that he had not paid the $100,000. He hadn't paid a dime of it. And Timothy is rightfully upset because you agreed to do something and you didn't do it. And you're making presumably some headway with a musician that you wouldn't be able to work with if not for me. And you're not keeping up your side of the bargain. And you're coming to me saying, well, that was a bogus deal anyway. So I see why he upset at your ass. But at this point, they don't clarify that. They're just like, we're mad at each other. I'm like, Anyway, but that's less important because it's a romance, guys. We have to care more about their personal relationship progressing. Dice invites her to move in. Uh, she gets more vulnerable talking about her dreams of being a star to make her mother proud. She writes a ballad about her mother. Billy decides to check out the foster office, the social services people or whatever, to see if they have any information on her mother. And apparently they don't. Oh, thank God she fell. But Billy is interested in reconnecting with her mother and trying to find her again. I guess now that she's making her way as a musician, she wants to, you know, make her mom proud and stuff like that. But again, for some reason, they don't have any information on her. Back at the studio, the new execs come to hear the new stuff for her new album. And they basically suggest that she should get rid of Dice and start working with a new producer because all of the stuff that she has prepared sounds the same. They shoot down all the music they've made thus far. And Dice at first seems to kind of just take that information in stride reluctantly. But it does become more apparent that Billy and Dice's directions are starting to split. She can't like take him with her everywhere. She's getting invited to things without him. She's getting invited to projects that have nothing to do with him. People are scouting her for movies, inviting her to perform at award shows, trying to get her to work with Eric Benet's sexy ass. I've never talked about this because why would this come up? But um, one of the first crushes on a real person that wasn't an anime <laughs> that I recall was Eric Benet. Hey. Georgie Pochi put in pie, kiss the girls and make them cry. Spend my life with you. But she started working with Eric Benet, sexy ass, who is obviously interested in her. And Dice is all jealous, like, he needs to be, you know, he needs to stop pushing up on my woman or whatever. Fine, I'd be insecure too if my competition was Eric Benet. But he gets so pissy that he makes her come home early. You ain't my daddy. Anyway, they in the car. He gets really drunk and starts getting super belligerent and ugly. He's arguing about, you know, Eric Benet and how he was pushing up on her because she dressed like a slut, cussing out her friends and calling them out of their name, fat ass and shit like that when they try to defend her. Like, hey, you need to shut the up. Real garbage man shit. And then the girls are like, pull over and they leave out and they're like, hey, Billy, are you coming with us? And she doesn't come out of the car. And so they're like, fine, we going home feeling betrayed. It seems like this where theoretically we should be having some high tension, more so than the rest of the movie where she just has to play like coy and like kind of innocent. And up until this point, she was just a bit underwhelming. But, but when they s argue at all in this movie, it's just... It's pretty bad, <laughs> it's, it's pretty bad. Back at home, he apologizes as she cries and she's like, I don't want any of this without you. None of this would have happened if you didn't believe in me. And I'm like, girl, shut the f up. He's a producer, you could have found another producer. Ain't nothing he did worth verbally abusing you and fing with your career now and being shitty to your best friends, like what the hell? Speaking of which, this is when the movie starts to get like sizably stupider because Timothy breaks into their apartment when Dice isn't there and tells Billy that he owes him $100,000 for her contract. She's like, I don't know about none of that. I don't know what you're talking about. And he was like, well, he hasn't given me my $100,000. So if he doesn't, I might have to uh, hurt you. She's like, what F me up? What, what is it me for? But he leaves, Dice comes back and she's, this is not her best work, okay? I'm not gonna tell you because you're gonna freak out and you're gonna make everything Billy, worse. Billy, you're gonna tell me exactly like what usual. I'm asking you. You tell me exactly Stop what I said. Stop screaming at me. It's not her strongest scene. Where are you going?
I believe personally that this is the scene that won her that Razzie because she won it honestly. Upon hearing that Timothy had threatened Billy, Dice goes to him, beats his ass, and is arrested for it. And this is beginning to be a pattern with Dice where he does something and it ends up up something really important for Billy. So because he goes to jail, she can't perform at some cool thing because she has to bail him out. And paparazzi are all over the place. It ends up being on the news. And she gets what I'm supposed to understand is upset, theoretically upset. They'll get over it. You know what? I'm over it. And she's like, I'm done. I'm over it. I'm not going to let you ruin everything that I've worked for. And Dice is a bitch because what signs have we had that he isn't? Says some truly foul shit, brings up her mother. Do you really think, do you really think inside your mind that because you swing your ass around on stage and you hit a couple of high notes here and there that you were some colossal success? Your mother would have been proud. And I'm just sitting there like, this seems like a lot of strife to go through for a man that looks like he smells like sweat. When did she get a cat? <laughs> anyway, they break up, I guess. And she returns to her friends who welcome her back with open arms because they know the trash. And now she's starting to work with Eric Benet's sexy ass. And, um, but regardless of how difficult breakups are, they're rarely easy. So she's still like, you know, lamenting over the end of the relationship to such an extent that she goes back to the apartment that they share together while he's not there and finds that he had written a song, the instrumental to a song that matched a song that she was writing separate from him. And there's this weird cosmic connection that they were able to make a song together while being apart or whatever. The she also sees that he had purchased a ticket to her upcoming concert because she was going to have her first concert at Madison Square Garden. So she kisses the sheet music, leaves right before he returns and he sees her lip print, lipstick mark on the stuff and he's like happy or whatever. But the happiness doesn't last long. Did I mention that this movie is also a romantic tragedy? Cause this is very funny. Because in very Greek tragedy fashion, um, <laughs> he gets shot in the alleyway by two. That's not funny. I'm so sorry, but this movie did not build that up at all. So when he gets shot by Timothy in the alleyway, I laugh. Not the first time. <laughs> at my last best of compilation for bad movies in a beat, there was like a hot six minutes of me just laughing at people dying. So obviously y'all have accepted it at this point. So go ahead. <laughs> And the first time I watched the movie, I didn't even know why they were upset at each other because I was doing other stuff. So I was like, what did I miss? <laughs> uh, in true Dice fashion, uh, she finds out that he died right before she has an important thing to do. Very inconvenient. You couldn't schedule your murder at a time that would be more convenient for me. So inconsiderate. But yeah, she finds out about it right before a concert. And this is her sad face, apparently. <laughs> Yeah, this is how she looks when the love of her life just got shot. Um, but the show must go on. So she gets up there and sings the song that they telepathically made together. But before that, she gives a whole speech doing the whole like, never take your loved ones for granted. You don't know how much time left you have with them, blah, blah, blah. After performing, she sees that Billy had sent her flowers and a letter that within the letter, he says that the people from the social work office had called his place looking for her to, to let her know that her mother is actually alive and well and is sober in Maryland. And they gave her information to contact her if she ever wanted to do so, which is crazy because if you sober, living well, is there any particular reason you didn't decide to reconnect with your daughter? Especially considering she's a mega star performing at Madison Square Garden. It's not like you don't know who she is. She used her real name. She don't have a stage name. That's your daughter, you know that, right? Well, shame is a hell of a feeling, so maybe that stopped her from trying to reconnect, but um, takes her limo that night, drives all the way from New York to Maryland, still wearing the same dress and everything, and she sees her mama, and they uh, hug and quote unquote cry <laughs> in the garden, and yeah, that's the movie. It's bad, it's tedious, it's horribly awkward. Uh, that's something I haven't really touched on a whole lot. Again, in the grand scheme of horrible movies I've seen, Mid-tier. Again, I've seen much, much more atrocious film. It was fun because now I have new 80s sounding tunes to play when I go to get lunch right now. <laughs> but that's all for today, folks. Sorry, I am low energy, but that's how it bees. <laughs> Depression got hands. I don't know. <laughs> 
I don't know what you want me to say. And that's okay. If you like today's video, feel free to like today's video. Feel free to send me uh, bad movie recommendations. I'm always listening. Oh, if you would like to check out my skincare set with Wish Trend, where you can get 45% off of skincare that I use, that'll be linked down below. Follow me on social media, Instagram, Twitter, both of which are KennyJD. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.